North, thanks for being on the show. Uh, I really, really looking forward to today's conversation. I, I guess a natural place to start is a common interest that we have for powerlifting. <laughs> so I want to talk about how did you get into powerlifting? I think it's only been a few, it's been a few years, but like I'm actually asking this question to get more tips and tricks from you more than anything else. So <laughs> just curious, how you how did you get started? It's funny because I knew you were going to bring this up at some point during the conversation. I just didn't know it was going to be the first question. <laughs> um, so powerlifting for me has been like part of a lifestyle for the past six years. The way I started it was, uh, was essentially, I was one of these people that hated the gym, uh, didn't like it, didn't like the association with it. But at the same time, I was very conscious of the fact that I needed to do something, right? Like I needed to work out somehow. Um, and for me, initially, powerlifting was kind of the laziest way to get into the gym, do a fast workout for 20 minutes and get the hell out as fast as possible. And then slowly but surely, when I started like seeing the impact it had on my health, on my physique and everything else, and even mentally, uh, I just got hooked. And I think one of the funnest part about it for me is like the self-competition is like how how well I did last week will always be beaten. Uh, so I'll always be better the week after. If I work on it, if I work hard on it, I'll, I'll most likely be better. Sometimes it dips, obviously. Um, but it, there's an aspect of self-competition that I appreciate about it very much. So yeah, so that's, that's the short story. If anybody is interested, how I started was through a book um, called Starting Strength. Uh, it's a very good starter book just to get the basics of... Uh, of uh, of lifting the movements, etc. It's by Mark Ripito, and uh, and yeah, and then now I have well, not now, but uh, I usually have a have a coach now that kind of helps me better my technique and my my uh, my strength abilities overall. So yeah, <laughs> so that's powerlifting for you, Nick. <laughs> well, do you have a favorite lift? I do. Yeah, I do. So do if I have lift? to classify them by order, so. Basically, in power of thing, you do squats, deadlift, and uh, bench. Um, my favorites by order is a squat, bench, and deadlift is last. So uh, my my favorite is. Oh really? So bench? I would have put deadlift before. Um, deadlift is interesting for me. I have a weird relationship with it. It's just I. F it's the one I fail at the most. So it's my nemesis. Hmm. Um, I don't fail as much at the squat. I don't, I'm, I'm improving. Well, I have been improving a lot with the, with the, with the bench. Uh, the deadlift is, is tough. It's really, really tough. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I was gonna say that was my favorite. So like we could actually, it's, uh, it's the deadlift squat, then bench. Um, so on, on back squat, do you, do you share any of your PRs? If you don't, it's fine. I won't bug you on your PRs. <laughs> My PRs, um, well, for, for the squat is, uh, it's, well, mid last year was around 250. Uh, deadlift was 270. And on the bench, on the bench, it was around 130. So, uh, so that's, almost. It's impressive. Like, <laughs> like for, for your weight, your weight class, like it's incredible. Like you, you're like, anyways, well, <laughs> I won't share mine now. <laughs> Don't ask me about my weight. I don't want to <laughs> yeah. I was, okay. So yeah, I was like, we can go down the rabbit hole because it's like I have like look, we just on deadlifts. We could probably talk twenty minutes on deadlifts, but I, it's probably not why people are tuning in <laughs> to this conversation. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because a lot of people don't expect it when I say that I do powerlifting. The always the first reaction is always kind of like a shock. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's something that I absolutely love, and I encourage everybody to do it. Like I got my brother into it. He's he's initially an MMA into MMA fighting. I guess the whole family is a bit more into sports, uh, so he's more into MMA. I got him into powerlifting slowly but surely. He's he's not admitting that he's a powerlifter, but he's slowly becoming one without knowing. It. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's like uh, the virus is spreading. Maybe last question on powerlifting, a personal thing, like uh, knee knee sleeves. What are your thoughts on knee sleeves? They are incredible. Um, knee sleeves are actually very, uh, they're a very interesting invention. They're a very interesting innovation in this world because for the longest time, I was, uh, I was more of a natural lifter. So no knee sleeves, no belts, no nothing. Um, and then my coach kind of forced me to, to, uh, to have it. Knee sleeves is basically, first of all, it's a protection piece of equipment. 
Um, and second, it adds to the total amount of weight that you can lift. Um, so it, it actually could increase from like from 250 from 240 to 250. That 10 extra pounds uh, could be easily added in because of the knee sleeves. Um, obviously, you need good ones with good thickness, etc. There's uh, there's a lot of complication around it, uh, but I highly highly recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just got my pair recently, so Good. like I'm interested to try they? them. But um, Can you talk uh, I forget the brand? brand. It was Amazon. It was. Okay. It's a good brand. It's a good brand, though. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, it's the, like how do I segue good. out of power? Yeah, they're they're not bad. Like uh, I've tried them once. I'm like looking for to like push more and try them out. But like kind of like the this back strap you mentioned, yeah. it's really when you want to you know like 80, 85 percent plus. Exactly. That's where it kicks in. It's not something you want to wear all the time, you yeah. know, because you want to let the natural motion of the body kind of like you know lift the weight versus like using support all the time. Yeah. Uh, but it's good for people that are more advanced because then you have this additional you know. Exactly, exactly. And for, for knee sleeves specifically, for instance, I don't wear them at the beginning of the workout. Like once I've warmed up, uh, then I put them on for, for higher weight or increased reps, depending on what I'm doing that day. But uh, they're just generally a good yeah. tool to have for, for protection in general. Yeah. <laughs> so we figured out how you got interested in powerlifting. Now, my next question is going to be, how did you get interested in the world of startups? Uh, it's it's um, it was sort of out of curiosity, right? So it was, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My mom was an entrepreneur. My dad, even though he was a doctor, he became an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurship has always part, has always been part of my life somehow. Um, and I've always wanted to kind of understand it in a, in a, in a deeper way. Um, and while, while I tried doing multiple initiatives that didn't necessarily work out as well as I wanted, um, a friend of mine told me about this new initiative that was starting up at Concordia University called District 3. Uh, and one thing led to the other. I find myself dragged into it within the first few months of its existence. Uh, so I wasn't necessarily there when, when the whole initiative was, was being brainstormed and, and, and created. I joined then right when they were supposed to launch. Um, and it was just for me at first, the 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 idea of of uh, of innovation and empowering people to create things and i have always been fascinated by you know entrepreneurs in general they don't they don't have to do this they can they're generally extremely bright and extremely smart people uh they could easily find jobs at the best companies in the world and yet they choose to do this instead then the reason why is because they're always driven by solving a problem um, using their skills to be able to, um, to to solve to solve real real problems and find solutions that are exciting that can help improve our lives in a lot of ways, um, and 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 technology has allowed us to do a lot of things that we weren't necessarily able to do a few years ago, and it's always constantly changing. And I think um, being in the world of startups can give us almost it allows us to live in a, a bit in a bubble uh, because sometimes we talk about stuff that most people are not aware of yet, uh, but eventually become, and you're, you're, you're kind of, you could, pre you can predict some of the trends or you could see some of the stuff that could impact the world and have an understanding or take a step back and see how you can, how you can engage with the conversation and be part of an improvement that could potentially lead to a better society, a better world. Uh, so for me, that was, that was kind of what dragged me into it is, is the fact that you know i wanted to understand entrepreneurship technology is super important and um i want i wanted to 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 have an impact as well i want my work to have an impact and i want my work to to be meaningful in a lot of ways and for me that was that was one way to go about it yeah it's a very interesting way to, to the way you put it right it's like a lens into the future right like and i think particularly district three it's been a few years since i visited but i remember visiting back in the day and it's like this really grassroots kind of like startup environment everyone's like stuck together on these like in, in these in these desks and it feels very much like weekend projects right these students are clearly still studying and like but they're doing this on the side yeah and you're like some of these once in a while do become something right yeah. they do become real 
ongoing concerns in real companies. Exactly. But it's like you're in this like primordial ooze of like innovation, if you want, where yeah. it's like it's it's very rough. It's not very well defined. But as you said, it's kind of it's kind of like a lens into what can be yeah. and eventually what will be right for some of them. So, yeah, very, very interesting way that you put it. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, a lot of a lot of the people at these threes, well, I don't know now, but um at the time yes there was a lot of students but a lot of them were not right like a lot of them were people with experience a lot of them were were sometimes phds uh that want to put in the, the that want to apply the research to the real world and you know they're they're again they're it's it was very humbling uh to be part of an environment like this because you, you realize how you know how much knowledge there is and how much human willingness there is to just put in the effort to put that knowledge in the hands of the people that need it the most. Um, and for, for us, in a lot of ways, it was about, in, in, it was somehow leveling the playing field a little bit in terms of access to, to the knowledge that is needed to develop something that, that would, would eventually become necessary. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty And then from District 3, you joined Zoo, right? So maybe yeah. uh, tell us what is Zoo at first, because I feel it's like this organization that's like has so much, let's say, backing and interest, but still maybe not as well known as it should be. Yeah. So maybe give us the quick sales pitch as to what is Zoo. <laughs> uh, so the sales pitch of Zoo, for those that don't know, so this initiative has been around since it was initially started in 2018. Um, by Guy La Liberté, founder of Cirque du Soleil. And the idea behind it is to give back to the creative community um, by providing them with space, access, technology, whatever they, the community needs in order to bring ideas forward. Um, and in a, in, in, a, in a primary way as well is to help, help that community develop their own IP, to be the owners of their own intellectual property and be able to commercialize it and, and scale it. Um, so as, as we said, as we were talking about earlier, uh, we have a beautiful space in the middle of downtown Montreal, um, really huge, well, well designed, um, that can that can host up to, I think around 90 companies in that in that co-working space. There will eventually be a space that is open to the public as well once we're allowed to have uh, a public space so that they can test and have everything that a company develops be put in the hands of the public right away to be able to test it, see the reaction, um, and get feedback right away. So it's almost like we're creating a village in the middle of downtown Montreal that is focusing on the future of entertainment. Um, and the idea behind it is also to use the state of the art technology and give the state of the art technologies to these creatives to be able to compete on a global scale uh, with, with, with production companies and, and other, other uh, uh such companies um so yeah so that's that's kind of the sales pitch of it it's it's really a unique environment um and i think montreal in a lot of ways is one of the best places to have such a space and in in and i i firmly believe that and that's why i decided to join is when you when you look at the at a startup ecosystem what you need is you need research organizations which we have we have exagram we have the nad we have a lot of really big institutional research organizations that focus on the future of entertainment. Um, we do have the big companies. So we have Cirque du Soleil, obviously, that, that's the, whose founder started this whole initiative, uh, Moment Factory, Thinkwell, and others. And we have finance. Um, the financial environment is there. So Sodec, FMC, um, et cetera. So we do have a lot of the building blocks to be able to have a thriving entertainment focused ecosystem here in Montreal. Um, and I think we, in a lot of ways, was the, we, we were the missing piece in terms of bringing all this together and giving support to the entrepreneurs to be able to move their ideas forward. Um, so that's why I decided, I decided to join because I, I really think that you, you, in, in a lot of ways, Montreal is, has a really good position to have a space like this. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like if you look at Montreal's history, right, like you mentioned like Cirque, but also kind of known as the festival and entertainment capital of the world, right? Like maybe not during a global pandemic, but yeah. in normal times, like we have Just for Laughs, there's the Jazz Festival, 
uh, of course, there's Cirque that's based here. Yeah. So it's like there's been so many successful entrepreneurial stories coming out from the entertainment world, yeah. uh, but nothing to pro to propel the startup environment, right? So that's kind of how I see Zoo yeah. uh, as like taking all this richesse, all this uh, uh, this wealth from from this ecosystem and helping elevate startups in that in that in that world. That's exactly it. That's absolutely it. It's uh, and it's it's fun to be part of it because we're seeing so many different ideas and creative initiatives uh, that that really are unique. And you know, we, we just closed, for instance, our, our call for applications and some of the best applications we got came from Montreal. Um, and we did get applications from around the world, but truly we do have, it is a natural resource here. Creativity is a natural resource. And I think I'm glad to be part of this initiative that is is helping propel these uh, these initiatives forward. Yeah. What do you see? Is there a difference? Like everyone talks about like the startup challenges, right? Like you, you said you're trying to solve some of them, finance, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, like getting money. <laughs> what do you see? Is there a difference with like startups in the entertainment space in terms of like, what does it take for them to kind of like break through? Um, is it is it a lack of just like in, a, in the regular tech world, it's like lack of just entrepreneurs and lack of good ideas often is the kind of the key constraint because capital is not a constraint. So curious to hear you as to what is there, what are the constraints in the entertainment, let's say startup entertainment space? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, so the, the challenges that we see with, with the startup in the entertainment sector is, um, is oftentimes obviously access to capital is always hard for any startup, right? Um, and the, the amount of capital that is necessary for an entertainment startup usually is higher because there is a lot more to be done. And generally speaking, um, they, they tend to focus more on the mass markets, which also requires a higher amount of marketing and capital. It's ca capital, more capital expensive. Um, there is also, um, and and that's true for for a lot in Montreal, right? Like it's not it's not just unique to the entertainment sector, but it's something we've talked a lot about while I was at District Three, and it's still continuing in the conversation now, which is the early adoption, right? It's having the big companies adopt some of the solutions of the of these startups uh, to be able to to test, to to play, and to to grow together, and specifically in times like these. Uh, when we're thinking about COVID specifically, where startups are known to move much faster uh, than larger organizations, we've seen solutions come out of startups that may a lot of times uh, change and, and improve on some of the challenges that we've seen in the industry. And I think in a lot of ways now, a lot of these companies are sort of not forced, but they're they're they have to kind of adopt these newer solutions, even though they're not necessarily 100% certain of how they work or how they function, but there is a lot more willingness to try and be comfortable with the, with the, with the uncertainty that we're all facing right now. Um, so, so these are kind of the, the, the main challenges, but I wouldn't necessarily say they're that much different from a regular startup because an entertainment startup is still a startup, right? They still need to do validation. They still need to do, uh, product testing. Their product might work. The, the, the sales cycles sometimes are too long. Um, and so the, the challenges are quite similar. What I see is, is a bit different is in terms, a lot of the times in terms of business modeling, right? Um, when we're talking about uh, entertainment companies per se, even though some of them have been some of the most innovative uh, in developing new business models, uh they're constantly thinking about new ways to monetize and new ways to engage with the public and create um businesses that are sustainable um for for yeah 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 that's definitely interesting. i like the the capital intensive piece is like well obviously it's going to need you know need mass adoption but imagine the test and learn can be done relatively easily right because you get your rating it's I imagine most of these are digital first businesses um, are there any sub segments in the entertainment sector that you know you find particularly interesting? Like in Montreal, we obviously have gaming. I don't know if you like you know SQ gaming just because it's kind of its own beast. If you're curious to hear you on any sub segments that you find particularly uh, interesting or that are you know poised to grow. Yeah, uh, as in particular, we're looking at the the a few segments actually that within within the entertainment industry. So. Uh, 
the first one being just in general fan engagement, right? Like we, we have the, the TELUS 5G lab at Zoom. Um, and the idea behind it is to be able to use and test new solutions using 5G. And I think 5G will impact in a lot of ways uh, what we call fan engagement. But fan engagement, engagement, what we mean is how, uh, how shared experiences can be transformed, right? Be it at home, in arenas, in the street, wherever you are, uh, the, the, the low latency and the speed of 5G can easily connect us on a, on a larger scale with multiple people. And, and it's, it's really fascinating to see um, how, how this piece of technology can basically impact that, uh, that sub-segment of the entertainment sector. Uh, the other one is um, tools for creatives. So anything that can allow us, like we're using right now, for you to be able to record me while I'm at home and you're, you're at your place, um, there, is, there is increasing need to be able to have better tools uh, to allow creatives to work from anywhere and work from anywhere, right? Uh, so this is another sector that we're really interested in. Um, and last but not least is, is, um, is everything related to new platforms, right? So when we're talking about VR, AR, all these platforms, how they're going to be used and applied to the future of gaming, the future of storytelling, uh, or marketplaces, when we're talking about the blockchain, Bitcoin, etc., all these will even eventually will have an impact on the entertainment industry in general, right? And some of them already do. Um, so we're these, these are kind of the three main um, segments that we're we're uh, we're looking and digging deeper into. Yeah, that's interesting. I I find the way you explain it makes sense, but I also find it be very difficult to isolate, right? So it's like I want I wonder if do you put any any constraints on these categories? Like for instance, you mentioned uh, you know uh, the creative economy, right? So it's like you think of like tools like Substack, mm -hmm. which is, which is known to be part of like hey helping enable creators here, you know bloggers to write. Um, you mentioned platforms, right? So like things like Clubhouse that are now emerging, right, for audio, but very broad. Uh, beyond just, you know, like entertainment in the classic sense. Yeah. So curious as to how do you decide to actively put guardrails as to like, you know, when you get applications, uh, if there are any guardrails or do you keep it broad and then hope to, you know, draw a larger pool of potential startups? No, we're obviously you, we obviously use the subset of the entertainment industry in general. So music, um, live entertainment, film, et cetera. So all these applications within these subsects of these, of these industries. So, uh, these are kind of our limits. So uh, we we've got a few applications, for instance, for for companies within the the education field, which, as much as we would love to help them, we're probably not the best placed people to do so. Uh, the network mm -hmm. that we have within the cell, even though when you look at it, it kind of fits in some of some of our definitions. But um, yeah, we're, we're we're looking specifically within again music. Uh, uh, films, television, production, uh, um, advertisement, etc. So there, there is a subsect of um, yeah, yes, yeah. Really Talk about um, what you, what do you see as you know potential exciting areas, right? So we spoke about some of them, but what do you see as these potential applications that you think, like going back to your time at District Three, that are just around the corner, uh, but haven't quite yet arrived? So curious to to, to pick your brain on yeah. Um, I think, I think 5G is definitely something that we're, we're all excited about. Um, the, the reason why it's, I, I personally firmly believe that the 5G is kind of the missing piece to unlock mass adoption to a lot of the technologies that we've been excited about for the past few years, be it IoT, AI, um, and, and, uh, VR, AR, et cetera. Um, I think 5G is, is, is going to bring all this together in terms of mass scale application. Um, again, because it's low latency, because of the speed and because of the, the amount of data that can be pro processed uh, virtually through the 5G network, is going to enable us to have um, rethink the way we, we share um, entertainment experience, the way we experience sports, right? The way we, we can instead of just being passive viewers, we can view the game from the perspective of, of the player. Um, 
and 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 a lot of and 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 the impact it has specifically on VR, right? And how the again mass adoption can become more um, concrete or more possible once a technology like this becomes, which is inevitable, right? Like we're talking a few years from now when 5G is going to become something that is available everywhere. And I think for me as well, uh, the exciting piece about it is that it's it's the technological leap that happens with new with new technologies like this that become become available, right? So the 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 way the iPhone or the the mobile phones in general transformed uh, telecommunication in uh, in Africa, for instance, I think that 5G network will have that same level of impact. Um, and when we're talking about entertainment in particular. Again, we're 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 talking about new new ways of, new ways of experiencing a lot of different things that we probably are not able to fully comprehend right now. And I'll give an example, right? So an example would be um, going from the MP3 player all the way to Spotify took a few leaps of technology developments, right? So the MP3 player was just a device that we used and we carried around. And with the 4G network, we were able to have Spotify and listen to music anywhere, anytime um, through our phones. And I think we couldn't have pictured or imagined uh, necessarily Spotify just 15 years ago. Um, and I think 5G is allowing us to create new ways of entertainment that we won't, we're, we're not, some people can imagine and are working on. Uh, and that's something that is going to be extremely exciting for, for the whole industry. And I think one of the coolest parts about, about our existence and, and having work at Zoo is the fact that the entertainment industry has always been the first to be disturbed by a lot of the new developments and the new technology. So when we're talking about the internet with Napster and downloading music, et cetera, uh, that was devastating. And then the 4G network and Spotify came in and that was another blow. Uh, but now there is more of a willingness to adopt earlier rather than being faced with the reality later, right? So you see a lot of 5G labs in some of the, the, the biggest production studios around the world. And I think what's cool about Zoo in particular is the fact that we're giving that same level of access to the tools and resources and the network to the smaller creators. Uh, which which uh, which fits with my personal mission of helping uh, the small fish become part of the big fish. So, uh, so yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> that's a that, that's a great answer. That's a great answer, Nora. I find going back to like the in, uh, the unlock, right? Like thinking of new applications. It made me, it makes me think of the iPhone, right? Where the iPhone came out, like I think two thousand seven, right? And it barely worked on stage yeah. <laughs> when when Jobs released it. Um, but it wasn't announced like this is going to be your new transportation device, right? Like people hadn't yet thought that no. this is going to like create like a decabillion industry like ride sharing, right? Yeah. Because of smartphones, right? Like Uber and like Uber was launched three years later, yeah. four years, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it was not a crazy amount of time. But in 2007, you, if you told people this is going to be your like taxi machine, yeah. they, they would have laughed at you, right? Yeah. Uh, so I find, uh, yeah, I find, like you said, there's an unlock. We just can't imagine it yet, uh, but people will, right? So people probably working partly at Zoo. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to what you said before, you know, your parents being entrepreneurs. Have you ever considered building your own startup or getting in that space yourself? Eventually. I mean, I, um, it's definitely part of the plan eventually long term to, to, to be able to uh, join something early. I think I'm, I'm and I've, I've, I've experienced this with V3, and now I'm experiencing it again with Zoo. Uh, I'm really good at building stuff from scratch, and I love that part of uh, of development. and um, And I love setting up the basis for for something that is exciting, that is impactful, etc. Uh, and I think that will continuously be part of my 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 career development, be it my own startup, be it something else. Um, I can't I can't necessarily predict that far into the future. I don't like to predict that far into the future. Um, <laughs> but for now, I'm happy with Zoo, right? Like I'm, I'm learning a, a lot and I'm, I'm, I'm generally excited about a lot of the companies that we're working with, right? It's, um, it's still something that, that gets me up in the morning, happy, even in the weird time that we're living in. Um, 
and as long as that's the feeling I'm, I'm getting from work, I'll, I'll, I'll continue doing it. So I wouldn't necessarily force myself to go into entrepreneurship just to say I did it. Uh, I'll do it once I find something that I'm like, yes, this is it. Or I'll join you because I believe in this and I, I definitely want to help get this started. <laughs> yeah, well, you definitely seem super passionate and, uh, and really inspired by, by Zoom and the work you guys are doing. Um, what have you learned maybe during the pandemic, right? So it's like you have this beautiful location, I visited, it's really fantastic. You're like world-class space that unfortunately no one can go to <laughs> right now. So curious about any learnings or insights in the, during this pandemic, how you guys have adapted? Um, it's, there was a, good, a lot of good things and a lot of not so good things that came out of the pandemic. So first of all, um, we had, we, l last year, we were launching one of the first versions of our full program for acceleration program um and it was the launch date was supposed to be march 13th which is right about the time when everything shut down um and so we had to push it and put everything online thank god for zoom right so <laughs> if you had told me just six months earlier that i would be running the program over zoom i wouldn't have believed you but that was that was the the case i think um and it goes back to what we were saying before before we started the recording I think humans have this incredible capacity to adapt uh, and we have adapted in a lot of ways and we see it happening across the industry. So when it comes to our space in particular, there are some, some areas of the space that are still being used, like the law, for instance, uh, we're allowed to use it. Obviously, we're putting all the procedures necessary uh, above and beyond what is needed to make sure that everybody is safe and protected and, you know, there, there are no... Um, no cases that come out of zoo, obviously. Um, but but I think some some of the key learnings that we we gathered is so that the capacity to adapt, and the other one is the the willingness to support one another, right? So once we've once we stopped being physical and we transformed everything online, we saw this massive need for 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 the entrepreneurs, even more need for the entrepreneurs to connect with each other. Uh, so when, when we launched another program last year, specifically for the pandemic, that was, it was not planned. It was not necessarily something that we had intention in, intentions in doing, but we had, we, we ended up doing it anyway. And it was probably one of the best cohorts we've ever had because the, just the entrepreneurs within it were again, some of the best people I've, I've ever had the pleasure to work with, but specifically they were, they were there for each other. They wanted to work with each other and they wanted to support each other. Um, and we've seen that also with the mentors, right? So the mentors uh, start referring us to more people and um, the community kind of grew. Uh, I think it grew more than we would have been able to do it if we were in a physical space, uh, just by sheer luck. It we we would have we gotten there eventually, but it would have taken us probably a bit more time to get there. Um, so we, we managed to still build the community even virtually. And the, the, uh, the, the I, I guess the not so good thing, and I th that's something everybody feels, right? Like everybody wants human connection. Everybody craves human connection. And I think we are excited for, for people to get vaccinated and everything to open up again so that we can share that space again with people and share some of the experiences that we're planning to launch there and show some of the startups to, to be able to again have a role in recreating these human connections again, which I think that's part of what the entertainment industry is all about, right? It's, it's about having, having uh, creating these moments for people and creating these experiences for people. And I'm, I'm actually glad that we're, we would eventually be able to do that for, for Montreal. Because as you said, Montreal is a city for, for festivals. It's a city that is known for its beautiful summer, right? Like if you, if you complain about the winter, <laughs> then you remember why I love Montreal once June hits, right? <laughs> So yeah, so we're, we're yeah, exactly. I find it such a it's, yeah. So that's that that's sort of what what, yeah, uh, it, what we've learned and what we're looking for too. I think it's really well said, Nora. It's like I find it's like right now is probably the best time mm -hmm. to start a you know a startup in the entertainment space because it's like because we're on pause. There's kind of like multiple factors. Like as soon as we get out of this thing, which hopefully sooner than later. Yeah. 
pretty much I think everyone in the world is going to want to like invest heavily in entertainment, right? Like go to more shows and like try and make up for lost time. Exactly. But also I think it's like there's no more preconceived notions of how it's supposed to be, right? Just because we've been forced to experience everything digitally, mm -hmm. I think people are going to be much more open to new types of experiences. Yeah which has technology as the starting point, right? So I think it's going to be fascinating from a growth and from an idea perspective. Yeah. So I find you're at the ground floor of kind of seeing the future going back. To, <laughs> to this so if you zoom out 2025, probably a lot of these like exciting companies are going to be at, you know, at scale and then performing well. So yeah, yeah. it seems like a super exciting time. Yeah. Um, Nora, I don't want to keep you more. It's been a great conversation. Maybe a final question will be where can people reach out, connect with you and learn more? Absolutely. Uh, I'm available on, on, um, on most social media as Nura ELB, so N-U-R-A-E-L-B. So you can find me uh, on LinkedIn, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Facebook, wh wherever, or, or Instagram. Um, I don't use Facebook or Instagram as much, but LinkedIn definitely. So Nur el uh, you'll definitely find me. There aren't that many people with that weird of a name. <laughs> I can relate to the weird name. <laughs> so both a blessing and a curse right yeah. well this honestly has been amazing Nora. yeah thank you so much for your time this has been great thank you thanks so much this has been like really fun i was looking forward to it and i'm uh, i'm glad uh, yeah. i'm glad it, it happened yeah likewise thanks again cheers